All right. So, uh, welcome to welcome to HTML5 and Drupal theming. I'm Scott Vandehei. I'm a front-end web developer from a company called Metal Toad Media in Portland, Oregon. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for the last couple of months, we've been working on an HTML5 base theme for Drupal 7. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that I've learned and introduce you to some of the basic concepts. So before we get started, uh, I'd like to know a little bit about you guys. So first of all, raise your hands if you've heard of HTML5. All right, that's kind of what I figured. Uh, now, raise your hands if you have created a Drupal theme before. Okay? And if you have used HTML5 before, like created anything with it. Okay, great. Uh, it's about what I was expecting. So uh, this presentation should be right up your alley. Uh, you know, we're going to cover some of the basics for you guys. So the first thing that we need to talk about when it comes to HTML5 is some of the design principles. Uh, when they set out to create HTML5, they didn't create it wholesale. Uh, it was, the, the idea was to retain a lot of what came before and sort of codify it. And they actually wrote down a set of guiding principles saying, you know, these are the rules that we're going to follow as we create this new version of HTML5 and sort of explains why they're creating it. You know, like what makes HTML5 better than HTML4 or XHTML1. So the first thing is um, support existing content. Uh, the, the way they phrase this in the doc is it should be possible to process existing HTML documents as HTML5 and get results that are compatible with the existing expectations. So basically, if you've written a document before, you ought to be able to change the doc type to HTML5, and it just works. That means no worries about, oh, well, we changed this tag to this tag, or, you know, we don't support the B tag anymore. No, if, if it was valid HTML at one time, it is still valid HTML under HTML5. The, the, the underlying point here is backwards compatibility. And the reason this matters is because it almost didn't happen. It sounds silly to talk about, like, oh, well, you know, how would you not have backwards compatibility on the web? But that was the whole point behind the shift to XHTML. Uh, so without getting too into the history here, basically in the late 90s, uh, after HTML4 was published, the W3C, the, the, the standards body that writes the HTML documents, they announced that they were going to stop working on HTML entirely. They actually killed the HTML working group and shift all of their resources into developing XHTML, which is HTML in the XML language. And the, the, the whole standards community got behind this. It sounded like a great idea. It was going to make uh, HTML a little more strict. They were going to introduce some more rules. It was going to make it more machine readable. It was great. The only problem is none of us were actually writing XHTML. We're all writing HTML using this new syntax. In order to be XHTML, it had to be processed in a certain way that used what's called draconian error handling. So if there was an error in your code, if you forgot to add a closing tag, if you used an invalid tag, if you used a B tag instead of a strong tag, it wouldn't just like be kind of bad. It would actually break. It wouldn't display in your browser. So Th there was a backlash inside of the community and basically all the browser manufacturers around 2006 said, you know what, this is ridiculous. And they formed their own group, started working on extensions to HTML. And uh, in, in late 2006, Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the web, actually came out and said, you know what, we were wrong. This XHTML stuff isn't working out. We're going to shift all of our resources back onto HTML. So it's kind of a long backstory, but the, the, the point is, one of the guiding principles of HTML5 is backwards compatibility. Uh, your old stuff won't break. The next idea is degrade gracefully. Uh, so HTML5 introduces new stuff, but again, we want to maintain that compatibility with older browsers, older files. So a lot of the new features that have been added have been written in such a way that they will degrade gracefully. Uh, a good example, we'll get into this later, but there's a whole slew of new additions to forms, new input types. So input type email, input type URL, input type phone number. Um, if you use any of these in an older browser that doesn't support them, they're just rendered as plain input, plain text inputs. 
So they aren't going to break. They just aren't going to get the fancy new behaviors. So if, if you've worked in the standards area at all, you're familiar with the concept of graceful degradation or uh, progressive enhancement. And that's been codified into HTML5. <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones. Pave the cow paths. Uh, you've probably heard this phrase before. Uh, it, it's an architecture term. So if you have, you know, your, your campus laid out and you've put down sidewalks at 90 degree angles, but all the students are cutting straight through the lawn, eventually they wear a bald patch into the lawn. They've created their own path. Uh, it's called a cow path, and there's this whole philosophy that when you create a new uh, a campus or something like that, you should maybe wait a bit to see how people are going to interact with the environment before you set down the paths in stone or concrete. Uh, with HTML5, what this means is if there's already an existing way to do this, if browser manufacturers or users are already doing things a certain way, go ahead and do it that way, even if it's maybe not the perfect way to do it. A good example of that is there's a content editable is a feature we'll talk about in a little bit. That was an old feature from IE like 5. And it's not perfect. It doesn't work exactly the way you would want, but it was already there. It was already codified, and it made more sense to the community to bring that in as it was rather than throw that out and write a new theoretically pure version. And the last one, this one sounds a little weird, but priority of constituencies. So all this means is that in, in the spec it says, in case of conflict, consider users over authors, over implementers, over specifiers, over theoretical purity. Uh, in other words, the end users, the, you know, the, the people using the websites we write and the themers, you know, all of us, count more than the browser manufacturers. Again, this sounds sort of common sense, right? Like, these are the people who are using the web. Those are the people who you should be building for. But that's not how it ever was before. It was always the browser manufacturers coming first because they were the ones building it, and they had a larger vote. So it's now been codified into the spec that whenever you're writing a rule, whenever you're writing a, a set of principles about how things should work, it should keep the end users in mind first, followed by all these other people in order. And the very last thing is theoretical purity. You'll notice a couple of points uh, I'll, I'll mention, this sort of reaction against purity. That, again, goes back to that XML thing. There's this, this sort of backlash in the community against doing something that theoretically sounds great but doesn't actually implement in the real world that well. So those are the, the guiding principles. So let's talk about some of the new features. Let's talk about the fun stuff. <laughs> so uh, just to be clear here, I'm not going to introduce every new feature. Uh, you know, if I did, we'd be here until sometime tomorrow. Uh, I'm just going to introduce some of the ones that I'm most excited about. At the end of the presentation, I'll give you guys a list of resources if you're interested in finding out more. So, who recognizes this? Anybody seen any code like this in their sites? Yeah. Um, who knows what this does? Video. Right, yeah, it's a video file, flash file. This is ugly, right? I mean, who wants to mess with this? Like, I mean, you can probably read it. You can kind of figure it out. Okay, there's a source file. There's a value. Anyway, here's how you do it in HTML5. Yeah. Oh, it just takes a weight off your shoulder, doesn't it? You just you can breathe easy looking at it. It's so simple. So there's a couple of things in here that you might not recognize. First of all, there's the controls attribute. Uh, this, one of those Boolean attributes. You can put it in and it's either there or it's not. So if you're using XHTML style, you have to write controls equals controls. But all that does is it says, when you show this video, give the user a way to control it. Give them play, pause, etc. It doesn't specify what controls. It doesn't specify how they should look. That's up to the browser manufacturer. So if you do that in Safari, you're going to get those quick time controls that you're used to. If you do it in i.e., maybe you're going to get Windows Media Player, you know, but the, the point is you're saying give the user the ability to control it. Then you got width, height. The poster attribute is another new one. Uh, so if you're putting up like a teaser trailer for a movie, uh, you can specify a JPEG that's a screenshot out of the trailer. So you can pick the frame that represents that, uh, that movie file. 
You know, now you can't pick the actual frame, you gotta specify a JPEG, but still it gives you the ability to control what that preview image is. And then finally, of course, you have the source. Now, the, uh, <laughs> the more clever of you will probably have noticed that, you know, hey, that's, that's an MPEG-4. That's probably not gonna work everywhere. Yeah, you're right. So this is the way you probably have to write it for a while. There is no standard video format yet. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this, a lot of back and forth. Uh, in a nutshell, you've got the guys at Mozilla going, we can't use anything unless it's 100% open and open source, and they're putting all their weight behind uh, Og Vorbis video, that's that OGV. Um, on the other end of the equation, you've got Apple and uh, uh, Chrome saying, well, we'll use MPEG-4. So anyway, the, the way you do it is you can nest source elements inside of your video tag, and that'll tell it, use this file. And the browser will just use the first one it finds that works. So you can actually put them in the order that you want them. So you can start with the open source friendly one and then proceed down to your DRM limited ones. Now, of course, this also doesn't work in IE. <laughs> so you need to add one more bit to it. So, yeah, I know, we're back to the flash bit. But this is, this is your fallback. You don't have to worry about this. That could just be... Uh, the embed code that you got from YouTube. You know, it could be a custom video player you made yourself. It could be as complex or as simple as you want. It doesn't even have to be there. This is your fallback content for browsers that don't understand the video attribute. And you can get even more, <laughs> even more complicated. If your browser doesn't support video and doesn't support flash, you can nest inside of the object attribute. This is old school, but you can nest an anchor tag inside of there. So this, this bit of code, which probably looks a little more complicated than it needs to, has four levels of degradation, four levels of fallback. It starts with the Aug Vorbis video for the browsers that support it, then it falls back to the MP4, and then it'll fall back to the Flash, and then finally it'll just fall back to a download. Like, I'm going to ask you to hold the questions till the end, but keep it in mind. I'm happy to take questions. Drop them? Yeah. I'm sorry. Is that good? Yeah, all right. Is that too far? Anybody scared of the dark? All right, I promise I'll try not to scare you. And I'll revise these slides to use uh, brighter text next time. <laughs> okay, so enough about the video. The input types I mentioned to you before. Uh, nothing that complicated. Basically, instead of input type equals text, you can specify search email, URL, or telephone. This is one of the features I'm most excited about because it is dead simple to implement. The browsers that support it just give you nice new features. The browsers that don't, yeah, it's no skin off your nose. It still works. Uh, now, I can't show you what it looks like everywhere because no single one of these is supported everywhere yet. But uh, a good example is, here's what the email tag looks like on the iPhone. Now, it just looks like your regular keyboard, but you'll notice you got the at sign there in the middle. That's the iPhone's email keyboard. If you pass it the phone number, you get this keyboard. So the iPhone is intelligent enough to look at that attribute and go, okay, I'm going to give you the correct keyboard for that input type. Um, similarly, if you give it the search attribute in Safari, it'll give you the, the Safari style one with the rounded corners and the little X. So. It, it's nothing that's going to make or break your site. It's just a nice little feature. It just makes your site work a little bit better. Next feature, uh, this is the one that my CEO is most excited about. Uh, <laughs> content editable. Now, like I said, this is an old school one. Uh, this dates back to IE5. Um, all this is is an attribute that you set on your text, if you, if, if, on an element. If you set it to be content editable, the browser now knows to go ahead and turn that into a text input field and let you edit it. Um, so this is kind of a weird screenshot. You can see here, I've got the text input cursor there and the little gray box around the input area. Um, that's what happened when I clicked on it. It was just plain text. I clicked on it. Now the browser is letting me edit it. Um, there isn't really a clear idea of what you do with this yet. <laughs> like everybody's very big on the, the idea. It's great. It's going to have content editable and everything. Um, what HTML5 gives you is a hook to tell the browser, make this editable. It gives you a set of API calls to interact with it. So you can say, make this text bold, 
give this a line break, uh, you know, indent this, center this. You know, you, you get some of those common text formatting things. What you don't get, and this might seem like kind of a weird limitation, <laughs> is any way to save. <laughs> Seems a little silly, I know. Uh, the idea is that you're going to write your own hooks via PHP or whatever programming language you're using that'll tie it into your CMS. So you're going to have to write that anyway. So the HTML5 API only concerns the actual editing and not the saving, deleting, reloading, any of that stuff. Uh, Dries is actually really excited about this. He mentioned that this could very well be like Drupal 9, like you know, you get this in there, you start editing stuff, and it all just happens in the browser without having to involve the, the back-end code. Uh, this is a, okay, sorry, the, the next thing I'm talking about here is the new semantic elements. Now, as a front-end developer myself who spends all day working on themes, this is the part that I'm really excited about. This, this makes me uh, all hot and bothered. So <laughs> you probably recognize this. Uh, layout, you know, so you got div ID header, nav, footer, sidebar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in HTML5, there are new elements for each of those. Now, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, right? You know, I, I don't really care about using a class versus a named element, but what it means is uh, rather than having your style sheet be, you know, div, 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 ID, ID, class, class. It's header, nav. You can read it easier, it's more semantic. So this is one of those things where it's, uh, it's a soft benefit, but it's gonna make your style sheets a lot easier to read. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, oh, right, uh, Google. Uh, where this came from, this might seem like an odd set of elements, like why this, why not something else? Why didn't they add, you know, uh, you know, contact or, you know, some other weird tag that's your favorite item that you use as a class all the time. Why didn't that get codified into the standard? The answer is that Google did a survey. And when I say survey, what I mean is the Google type of survey where they <laughs> brute force scraped millions of web pages for a month. Um, but what they got back from that data was the most common class names that people used for their layout. And what they found was people were everywhere were using Header, footer, nav. I don't really know where article and aside came from, but <laughs> yeah, the, the, the most common ones were the ones that everyone was using. So that's why those ones got codified. Again, that pave the cow paths idea. Uh, okay, you guys probably recognize this. This is the old doc type. So it doesn't really mean much of anything to anyone outside of W3C, but you put this in your document, you know that it'll behave correctly. Now, does anybody know the origin of doc types, like why we use them? Okay, well, I'll try not to bore you, but in a nutshell, it's purely for browser compatibility. There's absolutely no reason in HTML why you need a doc type. The only reason we use them is so that your browser knows which rendering engine to use. All the browsers that you use have more than one rendering engine. They have a standards engine, and they have the old busted engine. <laughs> so even IE6, when you render a document, if you if you give it an HTML document without a doc type, it'll use the old busted rendering engine that makes it backwards compatible. If you use the proper doc type, it goes, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. I'm gonna use the new standards. So that's why we have these big complicated doc types. And the guys who were reworking HTML5 were like, well, why do we need this? If the whole point of our language is that everything is backwards compatible and therefore by definition forwards compatible, we don't really need it. That's the new doc type. Nice and simple, right? Oh, it's great. That's a little worrying. Like, well, what happens when HTML6 comes out? And the answer is you keep using this one. Because, again, that, that whole idea, if it's backwards compatible, if HTML now must include all of the things that were ever in HTML, you know, you can't break old content, then HTML6 will render HTML5. So you don't ever need to specify a doc type ever again. You can, in fact, open up your website today and put 
this stock type on it, and it'll work. Nothing will change. Your website will look exactly the same. The only difference is it's now valid HTML5. <laughs> Similarly, uh, the character set. Uh, you know, this is uh, quite a bit longer than it needs to be. We've got all this stuff in here. HTTP equiv content type. I, I have no idea what that means. I've been working on websites for almost 15 years. No clue what that means. That's the new one. Just character set, UTF-8. Nice and simple. Why do we need all the other craft? So there, there's a lot of stuff like this in HTML5, just taking the stuff that never made much sense and simplifying it, making it easier. So let's talk about Drupal. How does all this stuff impact with Drupal? You know, what's Drupal doing with HTML5? And the answer is not much. Uh, it's coming in version 8, but for now it's up to us. Uh, Dries has talked about this. Dries, the, the inventor of Drupal, has talked about this on his Twitter feed a bunch. There's a bunch of stuff in HTML5 that he really likes and he wants to integrate it into the next version, but it's not going to be in Drupal 7. And since Drupal 7 isn't out, it means basically for the next couple of years, it's up to us if we want to use this stuff today. The good news is there is no reason you can't start using this stuff today. It is well supported. Uh, certain parts of it, <laughs> the parts that we care about, the, the, the front-end theming parts of it, you can absolutely start using it today. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of the basic Drupal templates and show you some of the changes you can make that will just help make your life as a themer a little bit easier. So first of all, I mentioned that IE doesn't play very nice with HTML5. Basically, it doesn't support the new elements the header, footer, nav, all that. All the other browsers, they see those new elements and they go, well, I don't know what this is, but you know, here you go. <laughs> IE sees that and goes, I don't know what that is. I'm not even gonna render it. And if you actually go view the DOM in IE, if you have those elements, they're literally not even there in the source. <laughs> so <laughs> your pages collapse, they do weird things. But the good news is it's really, really easy to fix. There's a bit of JavaScript that just tells IE treat this as an element. You know, this bit of code, treat it as an element. And the even better news is, you don't even have to think about it. A guy named Remy Sharp already did all the work for you. He wrote this really tiny, clever little JavaScript file. Uh, he's hosted on Google Code. So all you need to do is just include that line there at the top. You can wrap it in a conditional comment if you want, so only IE sees it. And that bit of JavaScript will load and tell IE, go ahead and use the new elements. If you don't want to uh, serve something from Google Code, if your client is nervous about it or you can't get away with it for whatever reason, you can just download it yourself and just drop it into your info file. Uh, okay, so that gets the elements to render, but in order to behave correctly, you want them to display as block. So you add this one line to your CSS and Bingo. Now all of your browsers will treat these as block level elements, just like P, just like div. The, the browser will not add any other styling to it. All it'll do is make them block level, meaning they'll have a line break before and after them. So if you want to change your content type to use the new content type, this gets a little tricky in uh, Drupal. This is how you fix it in Drupal 7. Um, in your template PHP, you add a function, and this is the HTML head alter function. I, I gotta confess, I'm not a PHP guy. This doesn't mean much to me. My programmers helped me figure this out. But in a nutshell, what it's doing is there is a, a, an array of elements that it puts into the head. And one of them is the content type tag. And in order to change it, all you need to do is go into PHP and edit the array. In Drupal 6, I don't have the code here in my presentation, but that code is not in an array, it's just a variable that's echoed out at the top, so you have to do a string replace. Um, I have that code up on my website, if you're interested. Uh, again, I'll have the link at the end of the presentation. The search form. If you want to change the search form to use the new search input type, again, another pre-processed form, you just put this in template PHP, and it'll go look for the search form variable and change it to use the new input type. Uh, Drupal 7 has a new template file, in case you don't recognize this, called html.tpl. 
This is just one level above page TPL. Basically, page TPL used to be at the top. It had all of your markup. Now they've taken the very top level markup, your head and body tag, and put that into its own template file. So inside of that, you're going to change that from this with the old doc type and all the HTML, XML stuff to this. So you're just going to use the new doc type and you can change the XML lang to just say lang since we're not in XML land anymore. Page TPL, similarly, you guys recognize this again, this is just those stack of divs, header, navigation, main. You can change those to the new semantic elements. <laughs> If this seems a little simple, I hope you understand, it really is that simple. There, there isn't any trick here, there's no fanciness. All you need to do is change those elements to the new markup. And if you've changed your doc type, it'll just work. In fact, if you've done it right, you won't see any difference whatsoever. Oh, uh, one more thing. Uh, it might look a little silly there, header, ID, header. <laughs> Feel free to strip that out if you want. but. The, the goal here was to not screw up your existing CSS. Since your CSS probably doesn't say div ID header, it just says ID header, now your CSS will keep working. Um, if you want to change that, you can just go change your CSS to just say element header instead of ID header. Node TPL, again, we've got div class node, we've got our headline, we've got our submitted and our content. We're going to change this one up a little bit more. This is where some of the new elements really come into play. So what you're seeing is we change that outermost div to an article tag. The article tag is a sectioning level element. All that means is that if you run it through an outline program, the, the outline program will recognize this as its own chunk of content. It means that it's easy to plug it into an RSS feed or something like that. So we're going to change it to an article. We're going to wrap that H2 and the submitted in a header tag. That wasn't there before. We didn't have an element around it. Now we do. Uh, and we're also going to wrap the links at the bottom in a footer tag. You don't have to do any of this. You can leave the header out. You can leave the footer out. It's all still perfectly valid. This just gives you a little bit more semantic code, a little more places to hook your styles into. And when you read your source code, it's going to make a little more sense to somebody who's reading it for the first time. Uh, same thing here for contents, for comments. Uh, the comments in Drupal are essentially little tiny nodes. Uh, they've got their own div wrapped around them. They've got their own headline. They've got their own submitted line. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to wrap them in, whoops. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, we're going to wrap them in a section and we're going to put another section on the inside. And then in the, sorry, I was off, wasn't I? Uh, comment wrapper becomes a section. This is back up at the top where it says uh, comments and add a new comment. We're going to make those sections. And then when you get into the actual comment form, this is like the article. So it's got div class comment h3 You'll just turn that into an article and a header. So finally, the last thing Drupal cares about is your blocks. We're just going to change those to sections. Um, the, the benefits here are not immediate, tangible. You're not going to see like different behavior in a browser, and that's intentional. You're not supposed to. The whole idea is to make it more semantic and make your life as a themer easier. You don't have to do any of this. If you change your doc type alone, if you just change your doc type, you can start using the other new features like Canvas or video or the new input types. This is all just optional semantic element stuff. So finally, the good news. I know that got a little overwhelming here. You don't have to remember any of that. Uh, if you'll permit me a moment of salesmanship, uh, at Metal Toad, we just created an HTML5 base theme called Boron and it's available today for Drupal 7. It's not much to look at. It's like Zen. It comes without any styles. You just slap it in. In fact, all it does is pretty much what I just showed you. It takes the built-in core templates for Drupal and converts them to the new HTML5 markup. So let's talk about some of the frequently asked questions that I've heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Uh, you might have heard the browsers don't support HTML5. Uh, as I've already told you, absolutely not true. All of the major browsers today, Firefox 3, Safari, Chrome, IE 6 upwards, can all use the new semantic elements and some of the new features such as video, uh, depending on how you set it up. There's no reason you can't pick and choose. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You don't have to say, oh, well, they don't support every little thing, so I'm not going to use it. Like I said, just change your doc type and you're good to go. You're using HTML5. You can implement the new features as they come into support. The new semantic features, which are the bit that I care most about, you can absolutely start using today. There's no reason to wait. You might have heard a rumor that HTML5 won't be ready until 2022. Not true. <laughs> this is based on a misunderstanding of the way the W3C releases stuff. I'm not going to get into it because it's really boring red tape stuff, but in a nutshell, the dates that actually matter are in 2009, the W3C released a working draft. In 2012, they're going to convert HTML5 into a recommendation. And in 2022, which is the date people heard, there's going to be two complete implementations. That's an estimate. What this means, <laughs> HTML4 and CSS2, which we're all using, neither one of them has two complete implementations yet. This is a, a W3C standard where they say, okay, we know that something is official, final, really honest to God solid when two browsers have implemented every single bit of it as specified. Nobody's done that yet for, for HTML4 and CSS. In fact, can anybody guess there's one browser that supports every bit of CSS2. Can anybody guess what browser that is? Firefox. Here, Firefox, here, Opera. It's IE8. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, obviously, you don't need to worry about that. Two complete browser implementations. It's just a weird W3C internal thing. The important date is 2012 is when it'll be an official recommendation, just like HTML4, just like XHTML, just like CSS2. And it is already a working draft. The browsers are already implementing it. You can start using it today. And finally, you've probably remembered back when you were writing old HTML, Oh my God, we have tag soup. You didn't, you know, you could capitalize, you could lowercase, you didn't have to close anything. There is, you know, everything was a mess. You know, does this mean we're back to the bad old days? No, uh, you know, you, you don't have to. HTML5 will allow you to write your code in either the old HTML style or the new XHTML stricter style. Both are perfectly valid. You can use closing tags on your Bs. On your BRs, you can uh, you know, lowercase everything, uppercase everything, quote it, not quote it. HTML is flexible. It'll work with you. So for guys like me, if you're reusing a ton of existing HTML code, all you have to do is change your doc type. You're good to go. If you want to go back to TagSoup, nobody's stopping you, but hopefully you've learned and you won't. <laughs> so you can just use BR slash? Yeah. Yeah, he asked, uh, can you keep using BR slash? The answer is absolutely. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, there's a reference page I put up on our website. That's metaltoad.com slash HTML5. It's got a bunch of websites with more details than I could get into today. It's got some book recommendations. And, uh, you know, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Space Ninja. Feel free to look me up. Should we open it up to questions? Yeah, absolutely. Questions. Should we turn on the house lights? Thank yeah. You. Yeah, uh, she was asking what the difference is between section and uh, article and div and absolutely there's a lot of confusion about this in the community at large. Um, the spec itself, the only distinction they make between section and article is that an article should be self-contained. And what they mean by that is you would put it in an RSS feed. So like a blog post is an article. Uh, a uh, contact form 
probably not an article. Like you wouldn't really syndicate that. And if that sounds kind of obscure and wishy-washy, it's because the spec is obscure and wishy-washy and people are still a little unclear on this. Uh, over the next year or so, I, I suspect we'll see a lot of this nailing out. But the way that I've seen most people do it is if you're doing a blog, the blog posts themselves are articles. Uh, the comments are also articles. And then you wrap your uh, logical sections in section tags. It, it gets really complicated because a section can contain an article and an article can contain a section. So <laughs> the intention is you can take a blog post and break it up by putting section tags inside of it, but you also probably have section tags outside of it grouping all your blog posts. So in a nutshell, just remember, are you going to syndicate it or not? If you are, make it an article. If not, it's probably a section. Yeah, ab absolutely. So she's asking about uh, nesting. So you can have multiple header elements on a page. Uh, and the, the answer to how you tell which one is which uh, is basically HTML looks at what they're nested within. So what's the parent container? So in the case of your topmost one, your, your actual page header, its parent is probably going to be body. But uh, inside of a, a blog post, it'll probably be article. HTML5 will just look at that nesting structure and figure it out intelligently. Your job as a themer is probably a little trickier. You have to figure it out in your CSS, so you don't want to write header, 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 or anything like that. What you'll probably do there is group them by identifying container. So you'll have, you know, dot blog post header. You'll have, uh, and that's why I left the ID tag on the outermost header. So header, ID, header looks a little goofy but it means you can identify the page header without having sloppy styles. The uh, baseball cap? Uh, yeah, what web authoring tool to adopt in HTML5? To be honest, I don't know. Um, I'm one of those horrible snobs who writes in a plain text editor, <laughs> so I don't know that. Um, Dreamweaver has a plugin, I heard. Textmate also has a plugin? A bundle? Okay. When do you use the aside element? Uh, another bit of confusion. Uh, in the spec, the idea is, imagine you're reading a magazine article, right? Like a pull quote that's sort of floated off to the side. Um, the idea is that it is content that is related to the primary content, but isn't essential. So, you know, literally like your sidebar is an aside, typically. Um, if you're you know, inside of logical content like a magazine article or a blog post, that distinction is pretty logical. If you're out in the idea of you know, my page layout overall, you know, my, my header, footer, sidebar, that gets a little trickier. In that case, I still think it's okay to use an aside, but like any semantic discussion, you're gonna have people arguing different things. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, typically it'll be section tags because the stuff in your sidebar probably wouldn't be syndicated. But yeah, you, you could absolutely have, and in fact this is how we did it in Boron, your sidebar becomes a side ID sidebar and contains nested sections and divs for each little sidebar widget. Yeah, nabs also, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's mentioning that your, your hosting server is going to have to understand the MIME types of any of the video tags you put up. It's absolutely true. And in fact, that's true today. Like, if you try to put an FLV file up on your server and play it through Flash, if your browser doesn't know what an FLV file is, it won't work. So, yeah, absolutely, you have to be aware of what your server supports. Or 
Yeah, you, he's asking whether you can do a three column layout. And the answer is absolutely, exactly like you would do today with a bunch of divs. The only difference is instead of divs, there'll be asides and sections. Um, but the, the CSS he used to do that layout is exactly the same. Any other questions? You mean like attributes? Uh, for the, he's asking whether there are any default attributes for the new elements, and I'm assuming you're referring to the new sectioning elements, the semantic ones like header, div, aside. There are not. Uh, they'll take any of the stock ones like ID, uh, class, stuff like that, but they don't have any defaults. Uh, yeah, she's asking what's the difference uh, between the new heading tag and the old header tags like H1, H2. And the answer is that your H1s, H2s, etc. will be nested inside of a header tag. The header tag is an organizational thing, just like a div, and the H1 is still your actual headline. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, so you could have a bunch of stuff in the header. Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, like the, the example of the blog post again, your header would probably contain an H1, but it might also contain your P submitted by uh, maybe even, you know, your date that it was written, stuff like that. Yeah, she's mentioning the uh, HTML5 has the new ability that every sectioning element, that means section, article, div, um, all of those, can contain their own H1 element. So instead of the old rule of you can only have one H1, you can now have H1, 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 H1. And HTML5 will make perfect sense of that based on those parent containers. I, I know that sounds a little crazy, and the short answer is, don't worry about it because while the browsers support it, it's unclear what the effects are on SEO and it absolutely can screw with screen readers. So for now, probably best to stick to the old H1, H2, H3, H4. How does that work as far as backwards compatibility? Well, there's the question, right? <laughs> How does it work with backwards compatibility? And the answer is that right now it doesn't very well. Uh, screen readers choke on it um, and it's unclear what, if any, effect it will have on your SEO. Um, Nobody's seen any evidence of negative behavior with multiple H1s, but I, you know I'm not going to take the risk on my search rankings tanking. You know, so that that's sort of a big question mark, right? He's asking about the Boron theme we've created and whether it contains any instructions for converting older themes like uh, Drupal 5 or 6 to the new Drupal 7. And no, we don't. It's intended to be its own base theme. The good news is we are working on a version, a backport for Drupal 6, and also a WordPress uh, version. I know that doesn't quite answer your need, but yeah, that's what we're working on. Yes, Joaquin? Why did you pick the name Boron? Okay. <laughs> Why did you pick the name Boron? Uh, Boron's elemental number is five. HTML five. It's, yeah. We we think we're very funny. <laughs> All right. Uh, any more? Okay. Thank you all very much for coming.